From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. What is all this, Johnny? Who's this? Roy Vickers, New Britain Mutual. What happened to Valentine? He was gunned down last night, going into a hotel with his wife. No. The police here are turning the city upside down, trying to get a line on two unidentified gunmen. Well, couldn't you keep him alive? I couldn't even find him. Well, uh, well, this is no time to be yelling at each other. I just left his daughter. Huh? She filed claim already? Through that lawyer Webster? No, no. She didn't even know anything about him until the papers broke the story. Well, I, I'm sorry I got annoyed for a second... Do what you can, Johnny. He'll want a full report. Sure, Roy, sure. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Britain Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is a further accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Valentine matter. Item 9, $7 for dinner. I had it with Inspector Charles DeBaca, New Orleans Police. He was a haggard, tired-looking man about that time. All of us were. You want some more coffee? No, no thanks. Two men... Both about six feet, wearing dark suits and hats, medium to slight builds. One possibly 35, the other possibly 40. A lot about ties up with the description of the two men who plugged Valentine earlier and earned him a place in the hospital. Yeah. We got more of a chance this time, though. There'll be some other witnesses. Somebody has to tell us what kind of a car they had and what direction they went. One thing, they weren't using silencers anymore. No, but they did a professional job. I think Valentine knew him, climbed out of that hospital bed to go out looking for him. Sounds reasonable. How do you figure the rest of it, Inspector? Valentine saw the newspaper story and knew his wife was in town. He went over, got her, and I take it they were going to check into a new hotel when their friends showed up. She just happened to get in the way, huh? Sure. Why'd anybody want to shoot her? Why would anybody want to shoot him? Well, because no matter what he was now or how he was playing it, he still lived pretty hard way back then. A man who's lived the kind of life he has and done the things he has is bound to make few enemies he'll remember. No, I think it has something to do with his family. I agree with you that Valentine probably made enemies all over. But he wasn't the kind of man to get excited about any of those kind of people. He pretty well knew how to take care of himself and handle trouble. That's why he was out looking for them. You sound pretty certain. It seems to me that if Valentine had been expecting trouble from some of the old-timers, he'd have carried a gun. You got a point. But then again, he was pretty gentled up. You know how he spent most of his time? Painting. Huh? And that house he bought out in Jefferson Parish is covered with pictures he's done since he's been out. Oils. Pretty good, too. When he wasn't painting it, he was listening to music. <laughs> You'd hardly think of Danny Valentine taking up the arts. Hardly ever. Well, I've got to make a call and get busy. Yeah. Inspector. Yeah? Any objection to me going out and looking around that house? It's your privilege. Personally, I'm going to look around town for a couple of gunmen. Anyone out there now? His cook. Her name is Yachino. Nice woman. Okay, I'll keep in touch with you, Inspector. Do that. Uh, Dollar. Now what? You forgot to tell me you looked up the old family lawyer, Conrad Webster, the other night. Oh, I was trying to find Valentine, the same as you. Well, if you happen to run into Webster again, you tell him to drop in and see me. Huh? He is missing. I didn't know what to say to that, so I left him standing there and went back to my hotel and shaved, changed clothes, and tried to go over the whole thing in my mind. I did phone into the police station and find out that the slugs that had killed Valentine and his wife were from an Italian-make pistol, a rum barrel, 37.5 caliber, so far untraced. Expense account item 10, cost of cab, from my hotel to Danny Valentine's house in Jefferson Parish. How do you do? Are you Mrs. Iacchino? Yes, sir. Who are you, please? My name is Johnny Dollar, Mrs. Iacchino. I'm from New Britain Mutual Insurance Company. I'd like to talk to you, if I may. About uh, Mr. Valentine? Yes. Not right now, Mr. Dollar. Some other time, huh? Well, if you prefer it that way, Mrs. Iacchino, but... It's uh, uh, been a hard day here. I, I mean, Mr. Valentine's death and his wife being killed with him. All of these policemen in and out of here and now. Miss Ward and all. Miss Ward? His daughter? Yes, she's here. Arrived two hours ago. She's... Stay here. Could I see her? 
You come tomorrow, Mr. Dollar, please. And tomorrow... Mrs. Yacino. Uh, yes, Miss Ward. Who is it? Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar, he's from the insurance company. I'd... Insurance company? Yes. I'd like to talk to Mrs. Yacino. Teresa Ward stood at the base of the iron grill stairway, tall and dark-eyed. And I saw that, like her mother, she had a quiet intensity about her face that made it beautiful. At the same time, ageless. She smiled politely at me. I could only stand there without speaking for a long moment, looking at her. Then Mrs. Iacchino excused herself, and we were alone. I wanted to talk to someone who might be able to give me a little more information about all this. It's all quite new to me. I'll tell you what I can, Miss Ward. My name is Valentine, isn't it? Really, Valentine? Yes, it is. Well, suppose we correct that mistake right now. Sure. There's nothing wrong with Valentine. From what a Mr. Vickers from the insurance office in Hartford told me, I'm to be quite well off because of this man that was murdered. You mean Dan Valentine? Yes, Dan Valentine. They tell me he was my father. Who told you? Oh, reporters at home and your insurance company. Mother told me my name was Ward. Poor thing. Must have been difficult for her over the years keeping the secret from me. Yes, she told me she thought it was the best thing. She, uh, well, the same as he did. Tell me about my father. Was he a bad man? Oh, as good or as bad as the Volstead Act made people. I only met him a couple of times. To awaken one morning and discover that you're the only daughter of a famous racketeer who's been murdered. Look, Miss Ward, if he had anything to do with the way you turned out, uh, with what you seem to possess within yourself... I'd say offhand that whatever he was or did, he thought of you. Are you flattering me? I'm not trying to. You seem like a very nice person. And so do you, Mr. Dollar. Will you tell me all about this, please? Well, let's see. Uh, you're 21, isn't that right? Yes. Just about 15 years ago or so, your father was on trial for income tax evasion. Just before he was convicted, he set up a trust fund with my insurance company to provide for you... It's been paying money for your support and education ever since. According to the terms of the trust, all of the money becomes yours now that your mother and father are dead. It comes to well over $50,000. That's all there is to it? Mm hmm I suppose I'm grateful to him. I suppose I should be grateful. I can't say that I'm particularly sorry about his death any more than I would be if any other human being died violently somewhere. But about Mother's death, I, I miss her very much already, Mr. Dunn. <laughs> she was holding up pretty well until that point. Then she let go. I held her in my arms and I talked to her. I told her what I knew of her father's life and death. She told me how she'd been reared so far removed from anything that might have been connected her in the least way with the Valentine name. Altogether, it was a revealing conversation for both of us. Mrs. Iacchino brought us some food and wine. How long will you be in New Orleans? Until all of this is straightened out. You mean until they find out who killed my mother and father? Yes. How about you? Oh, I really don't know. After the funerals, I suppose I'll go back. But I wanted to see him, to see what he looked like, what kind of life he led. He was just an ordinary man, wasn't he? Have you seen these pictures before? No, this is my first time in the house. Look like uh, Italian landscapes to me. Very good. Mm -hmm. Must have been something he had with Mother. Hmm? She was from Italy. May I ask you something? Yes. How do you feel about him now? Is this for your report? For myself. Well, since you've been here, these last two hours, I... I've begun to think of him for what he was. My father, I mean. I'd like to know why he was killed and who did it. Will I see you again? I hope so. Terry. Yes? I hope so very much. So do I, Johnny. I left her at the door that night with a warm sensation inside of me. Something I certainly hadn't expected in the business at hand. Mm -hmm. 
The next morning, I was back at the house talking to Mrs. Iacchino. She gave me all the information she could remember about Valentine's activities. All of it accurate, but lacking in any possible clue as to the identity of the two men who had killed him and his wife. I had breakfast with Terry there and helped you with funeral arrangements. Then I spent a solid 12 hours with Inspector DeBaca, who had still not located or identified the two mysterious men. However, there were other developments. This may be something, Johnny. Oh? Conrad Webster's been found. Huh? Up by Lake Punch train. Just identified him. He was shot to death with a 37.5. Italian gun? Yep. Just like the one that killed Dan Valentine and his wife. It later developed that the slugs taken from Webster's body when compared with those that had killed the Valentines were fired from the same weapon. The case took on proportions. Every available bit of information regarding the two ex-big shots of the 20s was located, read, and reread. It meant activity in cities like St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, and New York. But no new information as to the identity of the killers. I went back to the house. Johnny. Here, here, here. What is this? You're shaking. Oh, me, please. Sure. I suppose I'm being a terrible fool about it all, Johnny, but they've been after me all day. Cheap little things. Newspaper syndicate wants me to write my exclusive story as the shadow daughter of Dan Valentine. Fairy princess of a racket. Take it easy. Take it easy. Even Hollywood called a producer. Oh, Johnny, I shouldn't have come here at all. Then what would I have done, Terry? And what would I have done? Make yourself a drink, Johnny. I'll go put on a new face. It had become apparent to me in the short time I'd known her that she'd grown to love the memory of her father. Also, that the pressure of all that had happened was beginning to take its toll on her. We were walking down the gravel path away from the house. She was quieted down. I suppose I was thinking how nice it would be to kiss her. I twisted, trying for the gun inside my pocket, but there was nobody to shoot at. The two men who had fired the guns were already out of sight. I was alone with Terry Valentine, who was hanging on the gate... I caught her before she fell. Why me? Why me, Johnny? She was dead before I could answer. There'll be the final intriguing episode in our story of the Valentine matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a sober lesson in how long, how far, and how deadly one man's hate can be. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>